I was involved in 1979 and 1984 in a kind of an interesting experiment, and that is uh, I was president and CEO of a thing called the Council for a Competitive Economy. And it was an organization that was uh, dedicated to the idea that if we could bring all the really true free market businessmen together, <clears throat> maybe we could uh, lobby or at least make the case in Washington for a pure free market. Uh, and the idea was that there must be a lot of free market guys out there, but maybe they're in different industries and all that, and uh, we could pull them together. Uh, after five years as president, I discovered that uh, there were some problems with that model, but there were some also some ways that we might be able to approach it. Unfortunately, by that time, uh, Charles Koch, who had been one of the early uh, supporters of it, felt that... Uh, uh, it was a lost cause, and while he hadn't put a lot of money into it the last three or four years, he still controlled it uh, legally. So he he wanted to give the uh, mailing list to Rich Fink, who had ideas of starting a grassroots organization called the Citizens for a Sound Economy. So our organization was given over and all our assets to the Citizens for a Sound Economy. Fred Smith, who worked for me, took uh, some of our stuff and started the Competitive Enterprise Institute. So both of those organizations uh, are the uh, spawn of the council. The council isn't talked about much. It's not uh, uh, heard of. Uh, it was not mentioned in uh, Brian Doherty's book, uh, Radicals for Capitalism, except in one uh, line in which he talked to Charles Koch. And uh, it wasn't even mentioned in Rob Bradley's new book on political capitalism. So it's kind of a secret, and this is not a paper that I'm planning to publish as an article in a journal. It's part of a book that I'm writing, and uh, before I die, I'm going to tell the story of the council. Okay, my, my, uh, oops, whoops, my, uh, here we go. My, uh, whoops, there we go. My, uh, my, that, this is a, this is a, uh, just an acknowledgement for those people who think that I might be a business basher. I want to put it out there that uh, I believe that uh, the capitalist system, market system, uh, that uh, commercial and financial interests are vital to the functioning of the world. They, they, they are very survival depends on that. So I'm not business bashing, okay? That's the uh, first point. My second point, though, and the, really the point of this commercial or the, this paper, the takeaway is <clears throat> twofold. One, economic and financial interests are deeply involved in all legislation and regulation. Anything that's applicable to business, there will be business people involved in it, whether at the state level or the national level. <clears throat> and uh, because of that, uh, they ag aggrandize the state. Business is what upholds and energizes and aggrandizes the state in all 8,000 legislative uh, members around the country. There's 70, about, about 7,500 state representatives there's about 540 people in Congress. I defy you to find one of those people who doesn't have strong support from some commercial or financial interests. It's vital to them. And so it's not only that they're involved, but they uphold and they, they are part of what uh, uh, <clears throat> Albert J. Nock would say, the greater state. We have the government, but we also have the state, which is the king and his court, and all the groups that special interests that aggrandize and uphold the state business or commercial and financial interests are <clears throat> right in the middle of that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there are some principled free market people out there in business. No question about it. But my experience after over five years and, after, and uh, about 20 years as a state lobbyist in Kansas and Maryland and uh, Kentucky and five years on Capitol Hill is that the overwhelming majority are in that position because of circumstance more than ideology. Uh, Bill Gates at one time was uh, very much a guy who didn't believe in being involved in government. He didn't need government. He was in a new industry and most of the people who are we found in that way uh, were again were uh, were uh, were uh, a result of circumstance more than principle. But it doesn't really matter whether we have a lot of them or a little. That's not the point. The point is whether there's only a small number of businessmen who are involved or business interests who are involved in legislation or regulation or a lot. The fact is they're all, they're all out there. There's nothing that uh, isn't uh, touched. And that's the uh, commercial point or the, uh, the essence uh, rather 
is that uh, they're riveted on these things. The policies are continuous, uh, professional, widespread, very effective. Um, you know, I, I flew down here. If there's one thing I hate, it's the Transportation Safety Administration. Now, we all blame government for that. The airlines not only could have stopped it, they were in favor of it. Why? For the same reason that the Packers wanted the Packers and Stockyards Administration and the security bankers wanted the uh, SEC. They wanted government to convince people that their industry was safe. You should eat meat because the government is showing us it's good. You should invest with us. We weren't, we weren't the problem of the stock market crash. It's now safe. We're now regulated. And the airlines wanted uh, the federal government to say, don't worry about terrorists. We're going to control it. And they wanted to do it at public expense and not their own. And you can hear that all the time. I heard a baggage guy from Delta saying, hey, lady, look, it's not me. It's not Delta. It's federal regulations. You can't put that bag on there. They always want to pawn it off on uh, the federal government. I'll never get through these. <clears throat> okay, now people, there are people who have argued that uh, this is not, that these, uh, the business has not been so involved. Um, a great quote I just got to share with you. This is from George Stigler, <clears throat> who was no Austrian, but he was an economic historian, a very funny guy. But Anyway, he wrote, uh, imagine the railroad industry under the unwilling control of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1890. The industry had 700,000 employees, $10 billion worth of capital, dozens upon dozens of powerful, able entrepreneurs. The ICC had five commissioners, a staff of 61, a budget of 150,000, and infinite respect for the members of Congress, who in turn were not lacking in respect for the great industry of railroading. If told that the ICC controlled the railroads, the Duke of Wellington would have repeated himself. Anyone who believed that would believe anything. Well, the arguments against Stigler's thesis and that of Gabriel Kolko is, hey, we don't think that the railroads got everything they wanted. Well, the problem with that is, first of all, you don't know what the railroads wanted. And secondly, this is a big tug of war. There are other interests. So there are always commercial and financial interests tugging. One of the things that uh, the railroads wanted was uniform rates. So that if you were a shipper and you wanted to try to use the fact that you were in Richmond and it was farther for you to ship from Richmond to Chicago, the people in Baltimore said, hey, we got an advantage. We're closer to Chicago than Richmond is, and if these guys can't make special deals, and whether the rates have to be equal, we're home. And that's what they did. So they wanted the equal rates so that the shipping industry in Baltimore had the right to outcompete uh, <coughs> Richmond and some of these other, Charleston, all these other ports, in, in New Orleans even. Uh, so it's not, it's not, uh, well, let's go here. <coughs> Uh, okay, people say, well, it's, uh, we're, we're, all the lefts would say, we, we, we don't have capitalism, we have fascism. Well, it rings true, because you have, uh, the, those, the, people can see that. They see business involved in all these things. They see Goldman Sachs and all these companies wanting bailouts and the GM and all that. So the arguments of the left uh, are hard to dispute. Uh, but, does it really matter? I mean, does it matter whether we're 10% fascist or 80%? I mean, hardly the point. Okay, also a lot of defenders often discount political power of commercial financial interests, either because they're, uh, they're ignorant or because they don't want to reinforce those critics. Uh, it's, you know, as I said, it's like uh, people who think wife-beating reports are just a ploy to discredit males or marriage or something. That's not the point. All, all wife-beaters are husbands. So let's, let's acknowledge that. Uh, okay, where does the uh, elephant in the parlor come in? The problem is not what, govern, what, what business, apart from the aggrandizement of government, the problem is not their individual achievements. It is that this whole uh, climate, this whole atmosphere, spawns a powerful urge to rationalize. You know, the people have said to me, don't you understand, business needs to understand that what they should be after is the general welfare, not their own personal interest. I never met a lobbyist in 20 years of state houses and five years of uh, Congress who didn't say, hey, 
I can make the argument that what we're asking for is good for people. I can make the argument that it's good. Five minutes? Oh, that's great. I'm out of time? Thanks, Pete. Thank you very much. That's what he did yesterday. I saw it. Uh, I never met anybody who didn't say, I can rationalize how this is good. When I, well, the first, one of the first things I did when I became president of the council was I got, went up to Detroit to actually have a televised interview, or not a televised interview, a, 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 a debate, televised debate against the executive director or something of the Wayne County Economic Development Commission against the Chrysler bailout. Talk about in the uh, lion's den. But anyway, this guy argued that, uh, you know, yes, it's a a billion and a half dollars in loan guarantees, but I can argue that this is good not only for the economy, not only for the auto workers, not only for uh, general welfare, not only for taxpayers, not only for the economy. I mean, there was almost nothing that I could say that he couldn't rationalize as a part of... uh, the general interest or the general welfare. And this, this powerful urge to rationalize political capitalism is a bigger problem than what they actually achieve. And the other thing is that they also, uh, not only, not only are they spawning this powerful urge to rationalize, they discourage any discussion of the moral or ethical issue related to uh, using government. So what would happen when I was in Washington is we would find a company or an industry that was very much on the free market side and they didn't want to get, they didn't want to talk about ideology, they didn't want to talk about the morality or the ethics of it all because I might be back. I might have to be on the other side of this issue. So they have a very strong urge to eliminate any ideas, any ethics or any morality is just, they don't want to be. They just want to see the government as a tool or like a shovel that anybody has the right to pick up and use. It's totally a neutral approach. <clears throat> Most managers or executives tend to see their own industries as unique so that if you go to, and there are over 40,000 industry associations, 40,000 and the majority of them are in D.C. area. Every industry, every segment of industry, every regional interest, they're all there. And if you go and talk to them, as I did, they would say, hey, we're a free market. We're free enterprise right down the line. We'll say, what about this? Well, you don't understand. Our industry is kind of unique in that respect. We do need this. They all see that. It's, the rationalization is uh, impossible to get around. Uh, legitimate progress, okay, hampered by the power of business interest to reinforce, continue the need for, and the perceived majesty of the state, obviously. Uh, unwilling to brag of relative purity or to crit- criticize others. Uh, it, my feeling was after, and my feeling was after uh, those five years was there's only one hope. And uh, that is that we're not going to get people to say that their businesses are pure. Even Charles Koch, you know, famous libertarian entrepreneur, or philanthropist and all that, he'd never argued that Coke Industries was pure. He was a libertarian to the you know core of his boots, he would say. But you know, Coke is under certain uh, problems. We have certain conditions, or we just can't be pure. I never met a businessman who said my company can be pure. And it's not just a big versus little, and it's not also a owned versus uh, public corporation. It's all of them. They're all guilty of it. <clears throat> So they all, they all, they can't be pure as a business, but they can aspire. And so my model, my model at the end of five years was, I said, here's what we have to do. We have to change this organization to more of a business roundtable. And we want to tell business people, uh, I got, I got, I had some lists here. I just remembered. Yeah. I want to get some of these CEOs that believe. Because I, I would, Ben Edwards was a chair and CEO of A.G. Edwards' company, and he said, Edward, A.G. Edwards can't be pure. But he said, I believe in what you're doing. I, Ernest Williger was a CEO of Sealy Company, Sealy Mattresses. He believed, Sealy's not pure, but I believe. Uh, Getty Oil, even Chevron, uh, Porter Paint, Steinway Pianos, uh, Gifford Hill, Morton Buildings, 
Nucor Steel. I mean, there were a whole bunch of them, money more than Charles and some of these guys understood, of individual executives who believed. And so what I proposed to do at the end of five years was, look, let's take this organization, let's restructure it as a business roundtable organization. And then each of these members, if there's 50 or 75 or 100, will be very prominent. And they will say, I'm on here as an individual because I believe in this ideal. I believe that this is an ethical approach. I'm not saying my company's pure, but I believe in this ethic. And uh, I, we had 18 members of the board. I'm getting more personal than I meant to be, but we had 18 members of the board. They voted 17 to 1 to go in that direction. Unfortunately, the one was Charles Koch, and Charles owned the corporation. It was unbeknownst to our board. It was an actual stock corporation, and he owned it. And so he had the right to uh, uh, eliminate the board and uh, you know, start over. So, so we, uh, we didn't do it. But the, point, the final point is that I believe that socialism won the case because of a moral and ethical ideal. We have to get that. It's not going to be good enough just to argue uh, uh, intellectual arguments on this, uh, 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 practicality or any of these other things. It has to be the moral issue has to be injected into that milieu. And I think only moral outrage will cause public revolt and undermine the vitality is what I see as a uh, lamentable symbiosis. Okay? Thanks.